officers get there, she, there's actually wrestling a hammer away from her, and she's trying to strike uh, the lady who's trying to prevent her from harming her daughter. This is the woman the sheriff is talking about. Her name is Kelsey Glover, and she's smiling for the cameras as she's led to jail, and she knows her daughter is dead. I have the disturbing case out of Osceola County, Florida, and why the investigation is far from over. Welcome to Crime Fix. I'm Anjanette Levy. Kelsey Glover is in jail in Osceola County, Florida, facing charges related to attacking a woman who lived in her home, but she could face even more charges related to the death of her 14-year-old daughter, Giselle. Deputies found Giselle Glover dead in her mother's home on Wednesday morning after receiving a frantic 911 call. Here's Sheriff Marcos Lopez. Deputies responded after receiving calls about an armed disturbance. Deputies responded immediately and got to the house as a disturbance was still taking place. Inside the home, deputies apprehended the suspect of this investigation, Ms. Kelsey Glover. Deputies then spoke to witnesses who were also at the residence and learned that Ms. Glover, Ms. Glover's 14-year-old daughter, was upstairs in the bathroom and unresponsive. Giselle Glover, the 14-year-old girl, was not just unresponsive. She was dead. Deputies interviewed a woman who lived in the home with Giselle and her mother. Her name was Shanti Bryant. She would help take care of Giselle. An affidavit stated at around 800 hours, Shanti Bryant was trying to help Giselle by giving her a bath. Kelsey Glover became violent, then struck and pushed Shanti Bryant while she attempted to aid Giselle Glover. Shanti Bryant went to call 911 to call for emergency services when Kelsey Glover approached her with a hammer and chased her into the bathroom with the hammer. With the hammer in Kelsey's hands, she told Shanti that she wanted to kill her. What is described next sounds absolutely terrifying. The affidavit continues. Shanti was scared for her life and locked herself in the master bathroom while Kelsey continued to strike the door with the hammer in the attempts to break the door to strike Shanti. Shanti was in fear and called 911 to get help. Shanti was also unsure if the hammer had struck her in the arm during the struggle. However, there were visible fresh cuts on her wrists and arms. Sheriff Lopez said the witnesses in the home said they tried to save Giselle Glover. Witnesses also told deputies that they saw Miss Glover holding her 14-year-old daughter's head underwater in the bathtub and tr they tried to stop her but were not successful. Eventually, Miss Glover began attacking and chasing these witnesses around the house with a hammer, which led them to call also 911. The 14 year old girl was transported to a hospital, but she was declared deceased shortly after arriving. At this time, we're still waiting on a report from the medical examiner's office, so we cannot confirm exactly how the girl passed away. But we're launching a full homicide investigation that will be concluded soon. It's hard to find the words to describe how horrible this is. The people who were in the house must be so traumatized. And Giselle Glover died a horrific death. But take a look at this. Deputies led Kelsey Glover through a hallway and she smiled and she smiled broadly, a huge smile as she was walked down the hallway in handcuffs. She knew her daughter Giselle was dead and she was talking to a female deputy and laughing. As she made her way outside past throngs of media, photographers with cameras beaming her image back to TV stations live, she smiled and at times looked a little perplexed, but not overly concerned. I think it goes without saying that there's something wrong with this woman. She was supposed to appear in court on Thursday, but she didn't because of a medical issue. Right now, she faces two charges because of the alleged hammer attack on the woman who lived in her home. A homicide charge has not yet been filed in Giselle's death. The allegations being made against Kelsey Glover are so disturbing. I decided to search for her on truthfinder.com to see what I could find. Truthfinder is a major public records search service. I put in Glover's name and got search results. No criminal records appeared because she doesn't have a prior record, but there was a possible judgment for money. Truthfinder will give you those results along with past and current addresses, social media accounts, possible relatives and phone numbers. And another thing that I really love about Truthfinder, it will show you the addresses of sex offenders who live in your neighborhood. You should give it a try. And I have a great deal for you. You can get 50% off of confidential background reports. Just log on to www.truthfinder.com slash LC Crime Fix and start accessing information about almost anyone.
Newly filed court documents reveal the victim of the hammer attack, Shanti Bryant, told detectives that Kelsey Glover took her daughter off of her insulin medication and that Giselle became so sick she was vomiting, not eating, and feeling weak. The motion for detention states, defendant put Gigi, that's Giselle, in the bathtub and grabbed her by the hair and held her underwater. The victim was able to remove Gigi from the water and began CPR. The defendant attempted to prevent the victim's efforts and pushed the victim out of the bathroom. The victim contacted law enforcement, and the defendant armed herself with a hammer and began to threaten the victim. Law enforcement observed several holes in the door that were consistent with the hammer striking the door. Gigi was transported to the hospital and was pronounced dead. The Osceola County Sheriff's Office is awaiting the findings of the autopsy, but reasonably expect to add the charge of first-degree murder for the death of of the defendant's daughter, Gigi. And you might be wondering, does Kelsey Glover have a prior record? The only domestic issue we have there is one against her actual husband or the children's father where she battered him, he got an injunction against her, and that's pretty much it. Other than that, there's no other history in reference to that. Let's bring in Melba Pearson. She's a former prosecutor in Florida. Melba, this case, the allegations are just beyond the pale. Your thoughts, first of all, on the sheriff saying, look, this is a homicide investigation, but we don't yet know the uh, the cause of death. We have to investigate. It shouldn't take them that long, though, to determine that. Yeah, that's correct. And first off, this is just a very, very tragic set of events. Um, my initial gut reaction is that mental health may be involved because it seemed a very sudden escalation that wasn't really a history of domestic violence. Um, there was a prior incident between uh, the defendant and, and her partner, um, but there did not seem to be any violence directed towards the child. So, and also just hearing in the facts where she's chasing witnesses around with a hammer, you know, to me, that all really speaks to a mental break. And so, or, or addiction, I'm, you know, not quite sure. Again, we're going to have to see what the investigation reveals, but um, currently the victim would be um, at the morgue about to go through an autopsy. And then at that point, um, law enforcement and prosecutors will have a better understanding as to the cause of death. But it's seeming to me that it likely would be either drowning or asphyxiation if I had to guess at this juncture. Yeah, it most certainly seems like it would probably be drowning since she was holding, according to the witnesses, um, her daughter, Giselle, underwater. The witnesses, I, I, I can't even imagine the trauma that they've endured. They're being chased around by this woman, Kelsey Glover, with a hammer. They're trying to stop her from, from holding her daughter underwater. I, they are going to be just traumatized for the rest of their lives. Uh, so the, the autopsy will determine the cause of death and they should be able to do that fairly quickly. I mean, the final results will take some time because they always have to wait for the toxicology. Uh, you, you mentioned the mental health possibly being an issue that the, the sheriff said, and we, it's sad. We hear this so many times that there was no prior history of mental health issues. This is a 35 year old woman and she is being perp walked out, uh, out of the sheriff's office, being taken to the jail. And she's smiling and laughing and chit chatting with the deputies. I mean, uh, she, she knows she, her daughter is dead. She's been informed of that. She didn't appear in court on Thursday for her initial appearance because of a, a medical issue is what they said. So there, there's obviously something wrong here with this woman something is wrong it may be substance abuse it may be mental health it may be both so so how do we get to 35 years old and if it is mental health that it, how, how come there's no history so it's in, it's definitely possible that she had never sought treatment in the past with regards to her mental health or that she hadn't previously been diagnosed. Uh, many times people may have strange reactions to things, but no one in their circle is really like, hmm, we need to get you to a doctor. We need to get you to treatment so we can understand what's happening here. Maybe family members blew it off as maybe she was being eccentric or under stress or, you know, many times people justify people's behaviors and don't necessarily go to the point of thinking this could be mental illness. So that's a possibility. And to your point earlier, 
oftentimes we will see people with mental health issues often using um, narcotics to self-medicate because again they're not necessarily getting the official treatment as in you know whatever it is wellbutrin prozac whatever pharmaceutical treatments they could get from a doctor they may be using heroin or, or cannabis or cocaine just to be able to balance the feelings that they are that they're dealing with and so that could be a possibility that is both in terms of what unfortunately set these tragic events in motion it is just just absolutely uh, horrific. And, you know, it makes you wonder, too, if the medical issue that she was having on Thursday that prevented her from appearing in court had to do with her mental health. I mean, did something happen where she realized what happened? I mean, we, we don't know that. That's speculation on my part. Uh, but she um, is supposed to appear in court again. So it's, it makes you wonder, does she did she does she realize what happened? I mean, my first move, if I was the defense attorney in this case, would be to get her evaluated and figure out her competency. Because if she's not competent to stand trial, meaning that she doesn't understand the charges against her, she can't effectively participate in her own defense, this case can't move forward. And until she's competent, until she's restored to competency, she'll have to be at a hospital and be under regular observation and care. So that's possibly what could be happening. Also, she could be on suicide watch as well, because again, like you said, that realization of, oh my gosh, I just killed my child, when there, again, hadn't seemed to be any police activity uh, in terms of responding to the house or any, there seems to be no indication of prior issues between her and her daughter. So again, for this to happen so suddenly, to me, still speaks of a mental break. So maybe if she realizes what occurred that may drive her in a different direction. And now the corrections officers and medical personnel need to keep her on regular watch to make sure she doesn't harm herself. So that could be another thing that's at play here too, as well. Aunt Shante, the woman who was living with her, um, who, you know, she's accused of chasing around with a hammer. She was living with them, helping take care of Giselle. So, she was the one bathing Giselle when this took place, according to the affidavit. And, you know, you would think that she would have some insight into whether there had been some issues in the past. And it said that she would like take care of Giselle, give her her medication, that type of thing. So this woman probably has a lot of insight into what's been going on in the home. She lived there for two years. So they're saying there's no mental health history. I mean, I guess no documented mental health history, but this woman is living in the home. You would think that she would know if anything really, really crazy had been going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, it all depends on if mental health is the issue here. What is the actual diagnosis? Is this something that's cyclical in terms of, you know, maybe she'll have uh, she may decompensate for a while and then is able to and decompensate would be the, you know, I guess, legal word in terms of, you know, losing competency for, for a temporary amount of time and then is able to pull it back together. We don't know. And again, maybe you know, these are folks that live in the home, they're not medical personnel. So they can only say, well, maybe she acts a little strangely, or she might act a very obsessive about certain things, but they don't equate that to mental illness. So, you know, she she may have just figured out a, a coping mechanism to be able to live in the household. And obviously, the daughter was being cared for and and was being loved on on some level. So I don't know. I'm going to be very curious to hear her testimony moving forward as to what really occurred in the house and possibly if there were missed signals or missed symptoms of a deeper issue that could have been addressed previously. And then this could have sadly been prevented. So where do you see this case going? I mean, I think that we are going to see a homicide charge, a murder charge filed eventually. Uh, this is a homicide investigation. The, the sheriff said they want to take their time and do this right and give a, a good packet to the state attorney's office to to file that charge. Um, you know, he he's being careful. He's choosing his words carefully. But we know where this is going. 
Yes, uh, likely I could see second degree murder charges being filed because this does not scream of premeditation to me. This seems again to be some sort of break. Um, and so it would likely be second degree murder um, with relation to her daughter and then aggravated assault with a deadly weapon uh, in terms of the, the other witnesses present. Uh, you know, depending if there was any other kinds of injury or, um, you know, it, it could be escalated to maybe an attempted murder. We, again, it's going to depend on the facts. But long term, I see this case resolving either via a plea or, um, again, if mental health is really the issue and if she's found incompetent, then this case may end up in the long run being dismissed if it's a matter of she's being committed to uh, a, a mental facility, a mental health facility for a long term amount of time. And so usually those cases don't linger. If it's clear the person's not going to be competent again and can't really stand trial, then the case ends up getting dismissed. I believe it's seven years, 10 years, somewhere around that amount of time. Well, it is. Absolutely horrific, the allegations are, and uh, we will see where it goes. Melba Pearson, thank you so much, as always, for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And that's it for this episode of Crime Fix. I'm Anjanette Levy. Thanks so much for being with me. I'll see you back here next time.